Welcome into another edition of What Barry's Talking About from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. On this week's program, we get an update on back-to-school immunization. The health unit has been trying to get this done ahead of the start of school. We meet Nate Erskine-Smith, the Toronto MPP who wants the job as Liberal leader. Firefighters at Base Borden and others renew their effort to support the late Will Dwyer's quest to raise $2 million for the Terry Fox Foundation. We'll tell you how. And ice cream trucks are returning to Aurelia legally. But first, the Barry Bay Cats are looking for a lot of crowd support as they begin the inter-county baseball playoffs tonight against the Hamilton Cardinals. Bay Cats GM and field boss Josh Matlow is with Barry 360's Will Conkett. So uh, the smell of playoff baseball is here. What's your favorite part of uh, the playoff atmosphere? The energy, of course. The crowd, uh, the excitement. Uh, the guys get there early. They're excited. It's a whole different vibe. They do help when they're loud and, and energetic. And it does translate on the field. So you guys went uh, three and three against uh, the Cardinals in the season. Um, do you feel like you have a pretty good handle of um, what they are and what your game plan is going into this series? Yeah, they played us well. There's no question. Three and three is three and three, but uh, we won three of the last four against them. Uh, they are a young team uh, with uh, not much playoff experience. Uh, very different than last year when we played Toronto, who's an older team with a ton of playoff experience. Um, so we're, we're looking to take advantage of that. Um, again, the, the home field advantage is huge, obviously, with the crowd and the energy and uh, just playing at home. We have a pretty good home record as well this year. So uh, we're looking forward to getting it started. With uh, their possible inexperience, um, is that a kind of fine balance of having confidence going into it, but not too overconfident that, uh, th- that they maybe make mistakes? No, of course, we're not taking them lightly. They're still a great ball club. Uh, very good, very talented, um, and they can win on any, any given night. So we're not taking them lightly. Uh, we're going to give them our best arms. Uh, Frank Garcia is going to go game one and four if need be. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to be prepared. We're well prepared, and uh, we're excited to just get it going. So uh, it's a good matchup. It'll be a fun series. But uh, I think that uh, our experience and uh, our talent uh, hopefully supersedes theirs. Was there anything that you uh, have already kind of tweaked roster-wise at all or lineups-wise or anything kind of heading into this, or is it kind of just plain same? No, uh, we're pretty comfortable where we're at. We have uh, a lot of really good pieces. Um, they're really deep. Um, having guys there every game, obviously, in the playoffs, especially the pitchers, um, is a huge advantage for us. We have a lot of great pieces. We just want and hope that we have all the pieces put together at the right time for the playoffs two losses uh, to finish the regular season. Does does that disrupt your rhythm at all, entering the playoffs? Not for a second. It, most of it was just getting guys qualified, getting them the innings they needed. Um, I don't want to say we punted, but uh, it was just one of those things where we saw it to finish the season. We were locked into our, our spot, um, but we just wanted to get some guys in, in, the, in the ball games. but I don't think that affects us at all. For the Cardinals, they're coming to town for Game 1, like you said. Uh, what do you want to tell the fans and listeners heading into this? Uh, I would love if you can come out and support us. Um, we've had some really, really big crowds in the last few home games, um, and we've performed. So it's, it's one of those things where if you can come out and give us your energy, uh, we're going to do the same on the field, and uh, it's a win-win for both of us. It's a, a beautiful atmosphere, a good baseball, and hopefully a great playoff run. This is a best-of-five series. Game one tonight in Barrie. Game two Friday night in Hamilton. Game three back in Barrie Saturday afternoon. So, what's your favorite treat from an ice cream truck? My favorite ice cream treat is a caramel chocolate drumstick. After a number of years, ice cream trucks are once again able to legally take to the streets in Aurelia. It became a bit of a hot-button topic during the recent municipal election campaign and then an agenda item at council, compliments of Ward 3 councillor Jeff Shedderchuk, who joins Barry 360's Ian McLennan with the scoop, if you will, on how this is going to play out. Tell us about a bit of the background um, about uh, ice cream trucks in Aurelia and lack of them in terms of uh, on city streets. Where was the initiative uh, to bring them back? So ice cream trucks have not been permitted to operate in the city of Aurelia for at least 15 years. Um, When I reached out to uh, city staff, that's the the earliest records they could find, and it could have been a lot longer than that. Um, And in 2021, a uh, city councillor brought up the idea and was the council. Uh, His plan was to bring back ice cream trucks, and uh, Council um, was sort of in support of it. They wanted to see a bit more uh, safety regulations in place, but it was ultimately defeated. Um, And in the most recent election in um, 2022, 
Uh, there was a lot of talk about ice cream trucks because that article came out in 2021. So some people were still uh, talking about them, and it was fresh on the minds of a lot of folks. So the talk was at the door. So when I was door knocking, I could, uh, you know, recall many times uh, folks at the doors were telling me about the, the good times out with ice cream trucks and were wondering, you know, why it didn't pass and why they weren't uh, uh, permitted and, and asking those kind of questions. And we're asking, you know, what we could do about it and if it would be something that we'd reconsider. So I've always thought maybe in the back of my mind that it would be something that would be appropriate to bring up. And then later on in the election, um, another candidate actually made a, a post, and it was a post that gained a lot of traction and had over uh, close to 200 likes and over 100 comments um, regarding ice cream trucks and Uber, which were very hot topics during the campaign. And I figured those would be two quite simple things to bring up early on in, in the uh, new year with a new council of uh, five members, and I was right. hopeful that uh, it would spark some discussion. So. And then you did ask uh, council and uh, count, you know, at least city staff to an inquiry to prepare and report on the feasibility of allowing these trucks in residential areas. And council did go along with it. They're the experts. And there were a lot of issues raised by some councillors about safety around children and what have you. Where could you find an ice cream truck if it wasn't on the road in Aurelia before this passed? Well, the thing is, is that ice cream trucks were still operating in Aurelia uh, before this motion was passed. Uh, they weren't doing so... Um I would say, you know, with the proper regulations or with the proper licensing, they were not allowed to. Um, but people were still recalling that they were in the neighborhoods, and I got a few uh, calls from, from folks that were saying that uh, they would notice them in the neighborhood. So uh, that's the main thing I wanted to address is, you know, if they're already operating, obviously they're not operating with any regulations or proper safety measures in place. So this inquiry was going to do something positive no matter what. So if we were to allow ice cream trucks, then, you know, they'd be able to get their business license, they'd be able to operate um, within the city of Aurelia with a proper license, with the proper safety measures, and everything will be great on that front. But if council was deciding maybe not to do uh, so and maybe limit them to certain areas in town, we'd still have a little bit of control over those safety measures, as well as maybe bring up the discussion of proper enforcement, saying, you know, if we're not going to allow it, we should not allow it properly. Uh, because if safety is the concern, then we weren't doing our job. And uh, there was um, the the passage of this, uh, what was passed to council. There are a number of restrictions, and a lot, of course, reflect um, the issue around safety and protection of children, correct? Maybe if you can identify just a couple of them? Yeah, so uh, some of the current safety measures are a sign must be posted on the back of the vehicle that states watch for children. Uh, two amber lights are required to be on top of the vehicle and must flash while serving customers. Uh, the vehicle must be equipped with a mirror system that makes it possible for the driver to uh, see a complete 360-degree view around the vehicle while they sit in the driver's seat. And they're not allowed to prom- uh, oper- permit to operate after sunset and before sunrise on any portion of an arterial road and within 15 meters of an intersection. And if you're going to operate an ice cream truck, um, there are fees and liability insurance that's required. There's a, it's a business operation, correct? Absolutely, yeah. The city of it really has a whole uh, a whole uh, process of getting the uh, business license um, to the uh, ice cream trucks, which could take up to five days. So as of Monday, um, these uh, business owners can uh, um, apply for a license. Um, so it would be a license fee of eight hundred sixty one dollars. They need written approval from the health and uh, health union and fire department, and they need to show proof of uh, two million comprehensive general liability insurance. So did, when you were doing your homework, were there any municipalities uh, that you discovered that might have a similar circumstance as Aurelia, where ice cream trucks were not allowed on residential streets or areas? Yeah, there was a few in the area that uh, didn't allow. So I can't remember off the top of my head some of the names, but I know there's a few. I think uh, Midland might have been one of them, and maybe uh, Collingwood. And it was kind of a, a close split uh, when staff brought the report forward. They said about a 56% of uh, uh, municipalities in the area did allow, and some of the others didn't. So Romera, which is right next to us, uh, does not allow ice cream trucks. So it was an interesting split. I didn't get to dive into the reasons, but it was it was good having that context. And we're debating kind of, you know, we weren't alone in this, but it definitely is um, being one of the bigger municipalities in the area. We were definitely one of the larger ones in the area that uh, that didn't allow ice cream trucks because burying it still. Yeah, you know, so. yeah, respecting, obviously, the safety of both the operator and, and children and those that want an ice cream cone. To me, when I when I heard about this, it almost seemed sacrilegious because growing up, a, a, an ice cream truck in the neighborhood was part of summer. I, I agree. And, you know, when I was in Barrie and I've experienced an ice cream truck, it was a great time myself. And that's what many people at the doors were saying is they want their children and grandchildren to have the same experience they were able to have. And, you know, when they hear the music, it was just a, you know, a way of nostalgia, kind of uh, bringing back those great childhood memories. And, you know, if you're able to do this in a safe and um, appropriate manner, I think it's a really big positive for the community. And there's hundreds of people who have been engaged online saying this is something that they want and that they want to see again. And I think it's a very positive change if, if it's done so in the right way. 
Terry Fox had a dream to help eradicate cancer. The late Will Dwyer of Barry had a dream to raise $2 million to help make that happen. Firefighters at Base Borden have a dream to see Dwyer's dream come true. They're walking this weekend to support the cause. Barry 360's MJ gets the details from Will's son Robert and firefighter Jason Youngin. This will be our second year doing it. Uh, we did the first uh, We Will Walk back in uh, August of 2019. Um, so with COVID and everything that happened, it kind of put it on uh, on hiatus for a while. And then this year we decided to bring it back in, in memory of uh, Will Dwyer. What exactly does the does the, this event entail? You guys are going to be walking from Borden to Barrie, I believe? Yeah, that's correct. So we're going to be walking uh, from Base Borden Legacy Park um, to Will Dwyer Park in, in Barrie. So it's a total of 20 kilometers. And we're going to be walking in full bunker gear uh, with SCBA, some without SCBA, some just in gym clothes. So it's kind of up to the person or whatever they want to do. But I'm going to be walking in full gear the entire 20 kilometers. How much weight does that usually add? Uh, it normally adds about 60 pounds of extra weight to our to our body total. Oh, my. And how long does that walk usually take? Um, actually, it surprised us because we uh, we did the Google mapping and we did the walk, uh, the walk app. And it said it was going to take over four hours to do the walk. Um, and we actually uh, surpassed we surpassed the times. We did it in under about, I think it was close to three hours. We actually had to stop and wait um, because we were working with local media and our timings that were set for each kind of pit stop, we were way ahead of it. So we were actually surprised how fast we, we walked. We had to slow them down. They were going so fast. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and, but so you still made it for, to, for four hours while you were waiting for everybody, though. Yeah, by yeah. the time we got into Barrie, yeah, it was just under four hours, so... What I love about events like these is, and they and they sound like they're tough to do, and they are physically, but there's they're a lot of fun. There's a lot of camaraderie doing it all for for a, a goal, right? You're walking, you're chatting with your friends, and and I mean it's tough physically, but it's it, mentally it's it, it must really feel great. Oh yeah, it's it's an amazing thing to get so many fire departments put together and seeing seeing the names on the back of everybody's coats. You know, we had. Firefighters from King Township, we had firefighters from Barry, firefighters from Essa, all over. It was just amazing to see the camaraderie and nobody nobody really knew each other. And you come together and you do that 20 kilometer walk and you talk talk to each other and you're there for the all for the same thing. So it's really great. What does attendance look like this year for it? Um so far so good. We're just uh, we're getting the word out now through social media, through Instagram and Facebook. Um, attendance looks good. The weather is looking good. We looked at the uh, 14 day outlook and it looks to be cool and cloudy. So we're hoping we're going to be doing this walk rain or shine. Um, attendance wise, we're looking at, uh, we've gotten word back that we have some Toronto firefighters coming up from the recruit class, as well as the Georgian College pre-service firefighters. So I think we're going to surpass the numbers we had in 2019. What were those numbers? Uh, we were just about 100. So I think this year, 100 firefighters coming out. So I think this year we're going to surpass that. And hopefully we double it. They come out from all over. You, you'll get guys, because even la, uh, 219, same way. We didn't know they were coming. They just showed up. Do they have to pre-register or let no, you know that they're coming? Well, they can with Jason or myself, but uh, there's no real need of it. Jason, You're not going to turn anyone down, right? <laughs> no, we're not going to turn anybody down. We're, we're Anybody is more than welcome to come. And like I said, they can walk in full bunker gear or they can walk in gym clothing. Just as long as they're out there walking in, in uh, memory of Will and and as well as Terry Fox. And, and you don't have to finish it. Uh, people can walk as far as they want to walk and duck out, no big deal. To try to get everybody out and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully some make it. I know I will. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and it's important to note too that if um, you know people for whatever reason they can't do the walk but they want to show their support, they can wait for you guys over at Will Dwyer Park in Barrie and just cheer you on as you, as you make uh, your way in. Absolutely, because there will be a barbecue there. Uh, it'll be in around the 12, 1230 in that range. And uh, we'll have food on and, uh, and it'll just be, it's complimentary with a possible donation if you want to the Will slash Robert's $2 million goal. Of course, and is is it the, is um, fundraising page if people want to make a donation on behalf for the they, board and firefighters? Yeah, they they, they can actually go on uh, terryfox.org and just search Will or Robert Dwyer. That's great. And is your crew excited for this that it's coming up? Oh yeah, I think they're excited. I know they've been out uh, doing some training, doing some walking, trying to get the body, you know, ready to go, get it used to get it used to the long walk. Now, there is something, uh, a special thing from the board and fire department, a request, uh, or actually a challenge. Uh, yeah, we're putting, out a, we're putting out a challenge. The Base Board and Professional Firefighters Association 
is putting a challenge out to all fire departments and firefighter associations. We've donated $500 towards the Will Dwyer Terry Fox uh, goal of $2 million and we want them to meet or exceed our challenge of $500. So we're putting it out there right now. So if you're listening, <laughs> firefighters, come on, step on up. Show us where we're at. I love that. That's perfect. Anything that you guys want to add? Come on out the 26th and uh, cheer us on. Donate to uh, Will Dwyer's page. It's all. It all goes to a great cause in honor of Will and Terry Fox. Hope to see you there. What Barry's Talking About is a weekly podcast featuring the best Barry and Simcoe County have to offer and more. We've covered a lot of ground since we began last summer, delved into the frustrations of those trying to get women's hockey on the map locally, discovered a Facebook group dedicated to helping millennials find a mate, and heard why vendors at the weekly Barry Farmers Market at City Hall are reluctant to move to the downtown bus terminal. You can get caught up and make it easy to keep up in the future by subscribing to What Barry's Talking About through any podcast distributor. Still to come on What Barry's Talking About, getting the kids' immunizations up to date ahead of the school year and a chat with one of the candidates for the provincial liberal leadership. Now this. It's cool to care. It's a well-known fact blood transfusion saves lives. It's also a well-known fact that the world relies on voluntary unpaid donations to fill the need for blood. The need for blood never ends. Canadian Blood Services in Barrie is calling on you to help save a life. Please consider donating today. Appointments are mandatory and must be booked in advance. Book today at blood.ca through the Give Blood app or by calling 1-888-2-DONATE. Cool to Care is brought to you by the Peggy Hill Team. Keeping it real all the way to sold. Reach out now at PeggyHill.com. It's Cool to Care with 107.5 Cool FM. This is what Barry's talking about from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. Back to school clothes, back to school supplies, back to school immunization. The Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit has been trying to get a leg up on student immunizations this summer ahead of the start of school, something that needs to be done. We're joined again by Deanna Thompson, the Health Unit's Immunization Program Manager. Welcome back. Good morning. Thanks for having me again, Dan. Good to see you again. You were here a few weeks ago, hoping to get parents to get a wiggle on with this. Have they? Yes, actually, we've had a phenomenal outturn to all of our public clinics across Simcoe and Muskoka. Families looking to book appointments. Uh, We keep seeing the increase in uptake uh, in our appointments. So we're adding additional clinics. We're adding additional staffing to meet the needs right now within our communities. This is good news because I know there was some concern with uh, coming out of uh, COVID and uh, a lot of the, the the backlash over the COVID immunization, the COVID vaccination that uh, people were starting to think, do I have to get that? Do I need to get that? And uh, the fact that uh, people are getting their kids immunized is a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. I think that parents, you know, truly value uh, immunization. And again, I've said it before, it is one of public health's uh, greatest achievements. Uh, we have good success with it. And we know that when children, adults, when we're immunized, we're well protected. So how important is this then? I know it's measles, mumps, polio, and, and a few other things as well. Of course. So the Immunization of School Pupils Act does have vaccines that you do have to have to be in schools. And as you said, it's measles, mumps, rubella, polio, diphtheria, tetanus, meningococcal, and varicella, depending on your age. So there are a wide variety of variety of vaccines. Often they're given uh, one vaccine has multiple uh, components and they're extremely safe and effective. You can get these vaccines through your healthcare provider as well as through our public health clinics. And if you're unsure of what your child student needs for school, you know, connect with your healthcare provider or call us at the health unit. And uh, we have nurses on our phone lines that are, you know, working with families every day to, you know, figure out what they've had, uh, what they're missing and how to get them, you know, that caught up for school. And as we approach the return of school, you know, we want to ensure that all families have opportunities to get students uh, caught up before returning. It's been so long since I was in school and so long since my kids were in school. Do they still have those little yellow cards to keep track of things? Yeah, we do still have those. Uh, We have paper copies and often many families still have them, but there are electronic versions as well. (laughs) 
<laughs> as you can imagine. And as you say, it's easy to find out because you do, the kids don't need to get something every year. Correct. Um, it is based on their age. So it is important to make sure that, you know, you're reviewing uh, the schedule. Those schedules are listed on our websites, on Public Health Ontario's websites, Ministry of Health, our local health unit website, and on the yellow cards itself. We'll tell the schedule and can outline what your your children require based on their age as well as calling us at the health unit, we can help you too. And there are some exceptions to the rule, but uh, only a couple. Correct. Um, you know, in certain situations, uh, y- there could be medical exemptions, or you could have another valid exemption for uh, personal or philosophical reasons. And that's something that, you know, we ask parents who, um, you know, need to discuss those types of exemptions further, that they give us a call at the health unit and we help uh, support them and walk them through the processes. Yeah. You're not going to get a slap on the wrist because you're called. No, absolutely not. We really, you know, we're here to support families. Uh, we Again, we want to ensure that children are protected and safe uh, when in schools. What happens, because this gets checked up on early in the school year, what happens if a child hasn't been immunized? What's the procedure then? So right now, um, we are actively providing immunization surveillance. So that means reviewing students' records who are overdue for vaccines based on their age. And in September, high school students are at risk of uh, being excluded from school or suspended as we... uh, call it from school if they're not caught up on their vaccines. We are working with uh, those families to get those students up to date so they don't miss any of those important school dates in September. Any notion as to how many have uh, picked up on this and have it done and how many are left to, to get it done? Right. Early in January, for if we look at high school students specifically, we sent over 19,000 letters to high school wow. students. In June, we sent a rem- second letter as a reminder over 9,000. So we had really good uptake. And currently right now, our, we still have approximately 7,000 students in high schools across Simcoe Muskoka that are overdue. However, we know that number is dropping because of the number of clinics we have and the number of appointments and families also seeking support from their healthcare providers to get vaccines. So it's just uh, right now it's families, you know, probably scrambling a little bit in these last few weeks of summer, but um, reminding parents, you know, to get in, get those vaccines and report them to us so we can ensure that your student is um, up to date on our records so we uh, don't uh, remove them from school. It is the parent's responsibility to report all immunizations to the health unit, not any of the health care's responsibility. You mentioned, uh, as we know, a couple of weeks left till school starts. What's the grace period at the start of the school year? Is there one? Oh, yes. Um, you know, students will, if they're still outstanding for immunizations, letters will go out near the first week of September. So it'll be a third letter to families. And we're, our suspension date from school is not till the end of September. So we're, we're really, again, are working with families, lots of support, lots of clinics. And again, we want to get those students uh, up to date and immunized. All right. Number for somebody to call if they want more information, if they want to get updated because they're not sure if, if their children are due. They can call our Health Connection phone line and it's uh, toll free at 877-721-7520. And they can speak with a nurse on the phone line. And if they want more information in general, they can go to the Health uh, Unit website. Correct, at SimcoMuskokaHealth.org. Deanna, thank you so much for dropping by. Thanks for getting this done. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for having us and getting this important message out. Nate Erskine-Smith was in Barrie last week taking the pulse of the city as he gets things in order for his run at the provincial liberal leadership. Thinks he's the guy to lead the party out of the darkness and back into power. Our Ian McLennan tracked him down to get his take on the race and tell you why he's the party's best bet. I believe you were the first to uh, jump into the ring, so to speak? We were the first in early May. and Actually, we had been traveling the province to build a team and to rebuild, in many ways, an active presence for the party and, and our own campaign in every corner of the province. We started in, in October. Now, the Ontario Liberal Party, of course, decimated um, under Kathleen Wynne her last her last term, that last election that brought uh, Premier Ford to power um, under Stephen Del Duca. Again, not official party status. And I think it's fair to say that some people might be asking, why in the name of all things holy would, would you <laughs> want to do this? Why do you want to run for the leadership? And, uh, you know, take on such a challenge. Is this going to be a party rebuild for you or are you going for the mantle? 
This is a party to rebuild it in many ways, although we, we have to rebuild it quickly. So we displace the incompetence and lack of compassion we see at Queen's Park in the Ford government. But you get the why question a lot. And the better question in many ways is how, which is how do you make the biggest difference with the time that you have? And for me, the answer to that question 10 years ago was federal politics. We were in third place. We needed generational grassroots renewal. We needed to put that hard work in and to rebuild and to displace a really frustrating conservative majority government. And that's where exactly where we're at as a provincial government. And so this is about traveling the province, delivering, you know, re-articulating the values that, you know, I want the party to stand for, confidence, compassion, integrity, strong economic agenda, fairness for those in need. Integrity is the most important value in politics. we got to deliver serious answers to the big picture challenges everywhere. And then we, it's the hard work of rebuilding everywhere and rebuilding relationships, which is what politics truly is. Is it fair to say possibly that you're hoping that people will have tired of Doug Ford and the PCs after after two terms and that there's an opportunity for the Liberals to, um, you know, shoot to the top while continuing to rebuild? Is that possible? It's very much possible. I don't see the confidence in building housing. I don't see the confidence in managing public health care. I don't see the compassion towards education workers or the people on ODSP. And I certainly don't see integrity in how they manage the green belt. You, you see a a transfer of wealth to insiders and friends through backroom deals that is unconscionable. And so it's important that we draw sharp contrast, and I think people are rightly frustrated with decisions at Queen's Park. Having said that, we can't just be the Not Doug Ford Party. This is about articulating a really positive view of what we are going to accomplish, what we stand for on values, the big ideas, ambition, and delivering housing, ambition, and delivering climate action, ambition, ambition, and fixing our health care system, and delivering excellence in education. And ultimately, rebuilding relationships in places that we, we've, we've failed to have an active presence. And we have to rebuild this in northern Ontario, so western Ontario, and everywhere in between. Yeah, I mean, finger pointing, anybody can do that. What is going to make you different, right? Yeah, people do want to know, how are you going to improve my life? And I think people should have an expectation of seriousness in politics. And we don't see enough seriousness on these big picture challenges. Everywhere I go... There are unique challenges in some parts of this province, there's no question. But everywhere, no matter where I am, no matter what community, they want better health care. They want access to family health teams. They want mental health and addictions, especially in downtowns, to be addressed. They want seniors' care to be improved, home and community care. They want to know that their kids are being set up to succeed in, in a really strong, high-quality public education system. And they want to make sure that the environment is going to be protected at the same time as we're creating jobs, lowering energy bills, and most importantly, what comes up everywhere, housing. Housing, housing, housing. We need to make sure that governments are getting out of the way so the market can build, and we need to get governments back in the game on building non-market housing. I don't know if renegade's the right word, but in Ottawa, you, you, are, a, you are a bit of a maverick. Um, you don't always follow the bouncing liberal ball when the prime minister yeah. asks you. Um, right. and, and so not likely, I don't think you've served on any committees, and uh, you might be, you know, obviously maybe not cabinet material because of that the, the, how you how you operate but when you're the premier of the province it's okay i guess to dissent behind closed doors but it's good to look unified or how, how much free reign would you give your mpps that you seem to enjoy as a member of parliament in ottawa i left law for politics in part because of that promise of doing politics differently and that idea of empowering communities by empowering parliamentarians and the people who serve those communities and that's exactly the kind of politics that I've practiced over the last eight years and the kind of politics that I'm going to bring to a leadership role. And my own view is it's a great team-building exercise because if I'm going to ask you and others to join this party, to shape this party so we can shape the province, and then we've got a huge opportunity to do so, are we going to get really strong local representatives if they don't get to keep their voice on behalf of their community? No, we're not going to get serious people leave their family, leave pay, leave their privacy to join in building this and participate if they don't get to keep the voice on behalf of their community. And so it's incredibly important that we commit to freer votes and we commit to really empowering communities. And I, I can point to a track record of doing just that on behalf of my own community, and that's the kind of politics I want to see and the strong local representation that I want to build absolutely everywhere. How critical is it for the Liberals to break from the past? Uh, I'm not even including Kathleen Wynne, but Stephen Del Duca. I mean, the Liberal Party did uh, look at what happened, and, you know, Stephen Del Duca came out not a popular uh, individual, but, you know, with respect, he's now the mayor of Vaughan. So he's found, he's found another avenue, but uh, how critical is it to, for the Liberal Party to ha have, a, have a fresh start and break away? It is incredibly important that we deliver a new direction, 
and we have a leader who is going to bring charisma to the role, but also that's going to be able to deliver the grassroots generational renewal that we need in this province. We have a premier who is incredibly frustrating. We have a premier who you can call premier for many things. You cannot blame him for being competent. And you've got a premier who right now, you look at last week, you know, the news around the green belt, who has obviously put his own electoral interests and, and the benefits of his friends before the long-term public interest. And so it is essential we have a strong liberal party in this province to hold the government accountable. It is essential we have a strong liberal party in this province to displace that fr- frustrating incompetence. And it's absolutely essential to get as many people involved as we can to rebuild this thing. And it's going to take a new leader to do that. How would you govern um, if you were the premier? We talk the left, the right, the middle. Um, where does the Liberal Party in Ontario find its niche? Or Because it seems like it kind of lost its way at, uh, you know, back and forth. It was either a little to the right, a little to the left. Where does it need to be, in your opinion? It needs to be focused on getting things done when it comes to the big picture issues. So I don't see a level of ambition on building housing that I want to see. I don't think that's a left or right issue. We know what we need to do, and NIMBYism gets in the way, short-term electoral interests get in the way. We need a government with ambition and seriousness to get the thing done. On health care, similarly, we, we, we're distracted by privatization. I, I want to invest in nonprofit care. I want to reverse some of the changes that Doug Ford's made on privatization. But overwhelmingly, the core challenge is expanding access to family health teams. That's not left. That's not right. That's the right thing to do, and we got to follow the evidence to improve people's lives. And so, I, I you know, I, do we have to deliver a strong economic agenda? We are going to deliver a strong economic agenda. Should we be fiscally sustainable in everything we do? Sure, that's the only way you deliver lasting social progress. But I, you know, I'm more interested in delivering a, a really ambitious agenda that is going to improve people's lives and get things done. How will you counter, of course, they're going to come at you, the Conservatives and, and, and others, regarding uh, um, electricity, when under the wind government, claiming, you know, a number of businesses packed up and packed up and left, that the housing issue wasn't something that was created by Doug Ford, that the Liberals carried it over. I mean, how, how do you fight those, you know, those attacks that will come? Well, on the one hand, let's take electricity. You've got a situation where Doug Ford said he would lower hydro rates, and in early 2022, the financial accountability officer said broken promise. And we are going to deliver a really ambitious agenda to protect the planet for our kids. But we're also going to make sure we create jobs and lower energy bills at the same time. And we know that it is possible. And on the question of housing, look, Doug Ford, I will say a couple of nice things. He set a really ambitious target of 1.5 million homes over 10 years. He put a really smart group of people together for a task force. And then he completely ignored their recommendations. And he's expanding sprawl. And he's building on the green belt unnecessarily to enrich his friends. And what do we need to do? We need gentle density everywhere. We need greater density near transit. And we need, we need a government with the ambition and courage to actually get things built. And well, so I think there are many sharp contrasts we can, we can, we can make. And I, I'm not going to defend every single decision that a previous liberal government's made because I wasn't there. What are some of the decisions they made that you think? I mean, I guess maybe I should ask, what would you do different to, you know, in an election campaign that uh, maybe wasn't done right uh, under Stephen Del Duca, where, what are some of the fault lines that need to be fixed? I think in the last election we ran as a not Doug Ford party, and we have to very clearly define what we stand for. And that does include a strong economic agenda. It includes a sense of fiscal sustainability. It includes, obviously, a focus on fairness and compassion. And the most important value, if we're going to have people trust in the possibility of politics, we need to act with integrity and hold that up. And so it's about articulating what we stand for in a really positive way. It's also about not having this situation where we are the buck a ride party or we focus on exempting HSP on goods under $20 or we focus on restoring grade 13 niche issues that may have pulled well in a particular room. We, we need to look at the challenges everywhere across the province and say on health care, on education, on housing, on the environment file, how are we going to deliver serious solutions that improve people's lives? And lastly, we need strong local rep- representatives. And, and I'll hold up Karen McCrimmon here. We just won a by-election in Connecticut Carlton that we otherwise had no business winning, but it was because we had a really strong local candidate who's acted with integrity and has support in her community. Those are the candidates that we need. The new Liberal leader will be chosen December 2nd. And that's our program for this week. Thanks to Ian, MJ, and Will for their input, to Matt Ladder for his technical expertise, and to you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to what Barry's talking about, rate it, review it. 
You can also keep up with what Barry's talking about on X at Barry360, on our website, barry360.com, and on our daily Kickstart podcast, available from any streaming service and on our website. I'm Dan Blakely. Hope you'll join us again next week.